You know, stories from childhood have a way of lingering with us, don't they? I was talking to Mary Keogh just the other day about how when I was a kiddo on Saturday afternoons that were lazy, I would listen to my dad's reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder where there were stories, fairy stories, with such luscious voices. I can still hear the one about Rumpelstiltskin inside of me. And of course, there were not only those great kind of stories, but there were those that uh, came to the eye as well, like with Walt Disney, Snow White. Oh, I remember Snow White being so beautiful. And the character of those dwarves with their uh, singing off to work and coming back from work. And oh, that was so much fun. And of course, in that era was also the greatest story ever told. Who can forget Charleston Heston? You know, his arms out there and the water parting. I see heads nodding, yeah. And, and you know, another one that he did was Ben-Hur. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, his, uh, I can remember his arms out for the Red Sea, and I can remember his hands out on the reins for the chariot race. So, you know, I was trying to think about this. I don't remember much more about the story than his hands out there in the chariot race. And uh, so I had to refresh my memory. Maybe I'll refresh yours as well, if you don't mind. Uh, there are two boys in Palestine, Judah Ben-Hur and uh, Marsala. And uh, Judah Ben-Hur is from a, a wealthy Jewish family in Jerusalem. And uh, Marsala is uh, from a, a Roman family. Now, this is not the Marsala who was cowardly as a little boy and all the kids taunted him as Chicken Marsala. Uh, that, you know, that, not him. That wasn't him. Uh, this is another Marsala. And uh, uh, they have different destinies. You can tell because one's Jewish and one's Gentile. And uh, one has to do with Jerusalem and one has to do with the military. And you fast forward. And Marsala has come to Palestine in some kind of governance role. And Judah Ben-Hur is part of the, the wealthy, powerful family. And as Marsala is going through the streets, a tile falls off a roof. And it's a clay tile or a stone tile. But in all the tension, there's this thought that this has to do with an insurrection, an a assassination attempt. And he has Judah Ben-Hur arrested. Now, it, it's pretty clear that he didn't have anything to do with it, but it serves Marsala's power purposes to eliminate this uh, wealthy, powerful individual. And his father had passed away, so that's uh, two out of the way. All that remained was for him to throw the mother and sister into prison, which he did. Uh, Ben-Hur goes off on a slave ship and... Uh, years later, there's a storm. He rescues the captain from uh, the sea, and for that, he's given his freedom. With his freedom, he goes back to Jerusalem, and he insists to Marsala on the freedom of his mother and sister. Marsala finds them in prison and that they have leprosy. So he goes out and he just tells Ben Hurd that they're dead. We come to the chariot races, and Marsala ends up dying in them. And with his last breath, just out of spite, he decides to tell the whole truth to Ben-Hur. That is that his mother and sister are not dead, but they have leprosy. And this just uh, fuels the incendiary anger inside of Ben-Hur all the more. And that uh, depression and that anger uh, had to do not just with the betrayal, but with the awful fate that his sister and mother faced with leprosy. And I tell you all of that so we can get a, a feel for the kind of uh, fear and anguish that if you found someone with leprosy, you might as well just tell their family that they're dead. And that uh, he would feel such despair finding that they were dead, then finding that they were alive, then finding that they were lepers, all has to do with the way leprosy was back then and there. And we come in uh, the summer to stories of Jesus from Mark, that really direct and punchy uh, gospel. And we've been with Jesus on the first day and 
found out how all of his life came in six verses, and then he was proclaiming and recruiting. And now we come to him in this second day, second day, first chapter, and he encounters a man with leprosy. Uh, Josephus is a first century historian. And Jesus, uh, Josephus talks about lepers as being the living dead. That's, that's kind of graphic, isn't it? The living dead. And he uh, talks about how uh, they also experience death besides the physical one. They, they, all of us have a certain open-endedness, but they didn't to the end of their life. They knew what was coming and how it was going to come. And so they had that weight upon them that just kind of crushed their hopes and was kind of a premature death. But in addition to that, they had to be in isolation. They had to live in colonies. So they were cut off from family and friends. And that was a, a social kind of death. And whenever they went someplace, they had to yell out, unclean, unclean. And... This was more than a, a, a medical condition. It was considered a moral condition as well. Medical and moral. It's like we say uh, one bad apple spoils the bunch, you, and you want to get that bad apple that, out of there. They, they wanted to get the bad apple of the leper out of there. And I suppose it would be like uh, us with AIDS that we thought it was not only a medical condition, but initially we attributed it to it a lot of a debased kind of life. And you just kind of, I mean, talk about the parting of the Red Seas. The, the crowds would part when a, a leper came around. Now, Rembrandt has a painting of this encounter. It's not a full color painting. It's just done with line drawings where the, the lines are in a dusty maroon color on kind of a sepia paper. And what's striking about it is that it's very solitary. It's just Jesus and the leper, and way in the background you can see two disciple faces looking. But that's the way it was. You know, nobody wanted to be near the, the leper. But Jesus is there with that leper, and uh, everybody had to think, well, doesn't this guy know the rules? How can he just kind of break in, and even Jesus is just with him, but that guy shouldn't be around. He's supposed to yell unclean and stay away. And this isn't like yelling hot soup, and we all just kind of smile and, and stand back. Again, this is that, that tragic condition where they, they thought of there being a a physical and a spiritual contagion that was oh so dangerous that they just had to stay way, way back. Didn't this guy know the rules? Yeah, and I, I, I think he did, and I think that's why he was there. Do you remember the story of uh, Joseph Carey Merrick? Uh, he was made famous to us in the story called The Elephant Man. Uh, he suffered from Proteus syndrome. He was part of kind of a, a, really a freak show, and he was taunted. And in the movie version, uh, amid these taunts, at some point, he cries out, I am a human. I am a human. And I think that's really what the leper is crying out. I, I'm a human. And the way it comes out of his lips is to Jesus is if you are willing, you can make me clean. You can restore me. You can get me beyond this living death that I'm in. I think it's interesting that he says, if you're willing. I know when I ask somebody, for example, to preach here when I'm away, I, I say, if you're willing and able. Willing and able. Because, you know, I found people who are willing, but they're already booked for that day. So, uh, you know, I can't just say if you're willing, because they could say yes, and it wouldn't work out. And then there are those who are able. They're able. The date is free. But, you know, they just say, you know, I, I am so retired, I just don't do that anymore. So they're able, but they're not willing. And this one, though, yeah, there's no question about Jesus being able. He just says, are you willing? Now, I wonder for us today, 
If we default to saying, well, we know Jesus is willing, we're just not so sure if he's able. The question is, is he willing and able? Jesus says that uh, he, is, he is willing because what happens next are two beautiful things. The first is a, a, a beautiful word. Uh, we're told that Jesus is moved, and it fills out with either moved with pity, and sometimes it's translated moved with anger. The only other place where this word is used is with Lazarus. When Jesus comes and finds his friend is dead, it says he's moved in this way. He is upset. He is bothered by the plight of this poor soul. He's just bothered by it. But if that's the most beautiful word, the most beautiful act is that he then touches him. He doesn't shun him. He touches him. That had to be one of the many deaths that happened ahead of time is that those people, those lepers, didn't get touched. I remember when my first wife died. Long time went by. I didn't realize that I'd gotten so starved for touch. How many of you have been there? I remember going on a date some years later, and uh, my date just touched my arm. It was like my arm exploded. Uh, there's just that hunger for touch. They had to be like dry, parched ground when Jesus touched him. They've done studies, actual uh, studies of, say, baby monkeys, where some get touched and some don't. And the ones who don't do not develop. They do not develop psychologically. They do not develop physically. And here is Jesus touching. Isn't that beautiful? Now, when he touches, when he touches, what happens? I remember we, we said... Uh, one bad apple spoils the bunch, that that's kind of a, a metaphor for not only the whatever corruption is happening in the apple and how it spreads to the bushel, uh, that it's, it's, it's kind of a metaphor. But you know, you never, not that I know of, have a, a, a bushel of rotten barrels and you put in one good one and they all become good. It's, it's a little unfair. It, it seems like it should go in both directions, but it never does. So, so, well, maybe it does. Is that what happened, that Jesus was the good apple, and whoever touched him, uh, their corruption, their bad appleness went away? Or, or just think of it in medical terms. Uh, so you have a, a doctor in a sterile gown, and he comes into a, an infected place, and he touches the infected patient, and because of his uh, sterility, uh, they become well. Uh, that's not the way it works, is it? It's always that uh, dirt makes something clean dirty. Something clean doesn't make the dirty thing clean, except in this case. In this case, the good apple makes the bad well. The, the clean makes the dirty clean. The doctor makes the contaminated well. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't that make you just want to touch Jesus and have him touch you? A little bit more may be going on than that uh, miraculous idea. There's a story told of a little boy who has a sister who has a kidney condition. And they're looking for a, a match to help her out and do dialysis and cleanse her blood. And, and they realize she's going to die if they don't do this real soon. And the only match they can find is her little kid brother. And so they, they say, can we use your blood, you know, put you in this machine so your sister can live? And uh, he gets real serious for a moment. He says, uh, okay. So they lay him down on the table, one next to another, and they hook him up. And uh, the tubes are going. The blood is flowing. And the uh, nurse looks over, and the little boy has a tear going down his cheek. 
The nurse says, what's the matter? He said, uh, well, how long will it be before I die? See, he, he thought he was giving his life. He was giving his blood for her bad blood. And, you know, we wonder how Jesus heals this leper at the beginning of Mark. But we know the end of Mark, that Jesus, by his stripes, this leper was healed. By his blood, this leper was made whole. And by his stripes and by his blood, you and I are healed and made whole. Uh, Ben-Hur fetches his mother and sister from the colony and thinks that he's going to get to Jesus because Jesus has done what Jesus did here in Mark 1, 35 to 45. But by the time he gets to Jesus, Jesus is crucified. He's too late. Ah, but then there's that earthquake. And uh, in the earthquake, in the aftermath of the crucifixion, he turns and looks, and his mother and sister had been healed. You know, I don't know this morning whether you feel like you've got just a touch of leprosy or whether it's all over the place in your life, in your world. I don't, I don't know if you feel like Jesus is able but not willing or if he's willing but not able. Uh, I don't know how much you're hungry for his touch. But I do know, I do know that he is willing and able, that he does touch, and that when he touches, he makes whole. Lou Wallace is the one who wrote Ben-Hur. When he set out to write it, it was not to do anything else but discredit Christianity. And as he did the research, he found himself falling on his knees and saying, Lord, touch me and make me whole. I pray that you fall on your knees with me this day and say, Jesus, touch me and make me whole. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray.